Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Flat Out Racing Network's coverage of the Dark Horse Racing Series presented by Troy Lee Designs. Tonight, we are at Richmond International Raceway, race number nine of the fifth season. I'm Seth Cole, being joined by Scott Rankin and Alex Kalonik. Scott, I'm going to start with you because here tonight, Richmond, it's the first time that it's appeared on a Dark Horse Racing Series schedule for these guys. And we are getting down to the nitty-gritty, down to crunch time here for the championship, this is, including tonight, four races left on the season before we crown a champion. So uh, how important is that going to be based on the fact that these guys, at least under this banner, have not been at a track like this? And it's going to be maybe a, one of those key moments we'll look back on by the time we get to Indy. Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's, it is definitely going to be one of the key moments. That much is certainly for sure. Um, how much of a key moment it will be, that's still up for debate. It's a short track. It's tough. You've got to get the car all the way to the bottom of the circuit. You've got to make sure that you're getting your turn done. You've got to make sure that you look after your tires. Lap traffic's going to be a big issue. Cast your mind all the way back to Homestead. Earlier in the season, Luis Gonzalez Nunez running around lap traffic, overheats the tires, spins the car out, loses a wheel. That's the end of his race. That's the end of his night. Nothing he can do. It is going to be chaos here tonight, and this is the start of the run to the flag. Alex, we've got 13 drivers that are going to be taking the green flag here tonight. And uh, up at the top of the point standings, you've got points leader, two-time winner, and former champion Nick DeGruy, Craig Forsyth, going to victory lane last week at Kentucky. Three wins on the season in second. Matt Wagner, two wins on the season in third. It's looking like a three-horse race right at the moment. Those three separated by 71 points, but I mean... Do all three of those drivers have to look at Richmond here tonight and say, hey, I got I to gotta continue to make a statement here. I got to take another checkered flag. I mean, I'll, I'll probably put this one over under Alex, but my, my state is that you've got to get yourself sort of in the game. You've got to give yourself an opportunity such that when Indy comes around, you're at least going, hey, I need to finish fifth and X needs to finish, you know, last for me to win this thing. Hey, this guy needs to finish in this position. I got to do something better than that to finish in this position. You know, so at least start considering the points. It might be time for the leader of the championship to just sit down, look at the results and go, yeah, you know what? Third place at the end of this season, at the end of this race right now, that's probably enough. And Alex, I mean, you've been in these sorts of situations before. You've got a lot more experience than I do. I mean, especially when you are higher up in the point standings, it definitely becomes a lot more of just manage your races. You know, once you get off to that good start for some of the people further up in our point standings to Groot, Forsyth, Wagner, they just kind of have to make sure that they don't crash and don't lose that advantage they have over the rest of the field. But then you have guys who aren't as great in points and might find themselves competitive for this one race tonight they start driving a lot harder a lot more aggressive and that's where you'll see a lot of mistakes happen is a lot of guys just searching for the points that they don't have say eric peterson for example say our pole sitter eric peterson for example and you guys could correct me if i'm wrong but it just kind of seems like looking at the races we got less left for the schedule richmond here tonight michigan chicago and indianapolis tonight might be the last racetrack on the season where finesse is really going to come into play rather than just raw speed as we're underway here tonight 140 laps on tap for these drivers under the lights in richmond virginia Ooh. And Craig Forsyth got something happened to him on the initial start. I mean, it's actually difficult to get these cars going. No yellow either. He's he's going to be dead last in the opening phases. We've seen a lot of issues here on the racetrack as Rick Ravon has taken the lead away from Eric Peterson with a fantastic move down in turns three and four. He's really getting that race car down to the bottom good and early on the corner, and that's got to help him at least with the drive off the corner as he doesn't have to worry about turning on that corner exit. Yeah, Scott, we saw the defending champion, Rick Ravon, make his return to the series last week. Almost picked up a victory, second in that Kentucky race. Nice to see him back behind the wheel. And uh, you got to think, you know, he knows that this season he's not going to be able to take that championship with just the limited starts here near the end. But that doesn't stop his drive to find victory lane for sure. No, absolutely. And I mean, you know, he, he was here last week. He, he ran very, very well. And it made for an amazing closing stages of that race as well. And, you know, all of a sudden, the, the likes of a guy like Charles Teed surging to the fore late on in the race had an awesome opportunity. You know, these guys that are here, they don't have a lot of opportunity. Things, you know, got in the way from them competing earlier on in the season. Rick Ravon's amongst those. And, you know, he's, he's back and going, hey, this is why I was champion last season. Watching the sixth place battle here. That's Jeff Hysong, the 18, to the inside of Yari Brewpacher. Jim Brooks in that mix there as well. As a matter of fact, uh, both of the Brooks 
coming in tonight. Would love to see the top three. Point stamps have an issue, and there goes Jim off of turn two. Back end stepped out. Front wing into that inside rail. That's not even a save for barrier, and now the caution will fly. Yeah, that's unfortunate for, for Jim. I mean, you know, he, he had a very strong showing last week. He's been consistently in and around the podium. He's had a phenomenal season. Honestly, this is the best that I've actually seen him drive. He, I don't think he's driven anywhere near this skillfully over the last couple seasons. That's disappointing. There's nothing sometimes that you can do. It's a, it's a, a tricky circuit. These cars are tricky to drive around here. Stock cars struggle to make it around here. Stock cars tend to get tight, tend to get loose, tend to get all over the place. Indy cars, they need aero. That means they need speed. And this is a short track. And this is a tight short track as well. Yeah, well, one of the things I noticed while trying to test this car myself around this racetrack is that it is very, very tricky right on the corner exit and right in the center when it comes to the throttle inputs. If you get off too much, boom, that car goes around Ooh. on you. And if you put it down too hard, boom, it snaps around on you. So we've seen a bunch of people come down pit lane. Is that our top three prior to that? I think that was. So you've got... I think it's actually the top four prior to that didn't opt to come down pit road under that caution. So Rick Ravon was obviously our leader prior to this. And then you've got Eric Peterson who's right in there behind him. I'm pretty sure it was Luis Gonzalez Nunez that had settled into third place and Matt Wagner. Just about every other car down pit lane. Like... Alex, are they looking at fuel numbers? Are they going tire wear is a big factor in this one? I think we were talking to Eric Peterson prior to the race, and he said something that, that, that wasn't that. that it was, you know, there were other factors that were more important than the tires. I mean, fuel seems like to me, from what numbers we got, we got 48 laps on a stint on fuel, and around this short track, that is not very long at all. These drivers could just be refilling the fuel tanks just so they could go that little bit further on fuel, because... Green flag pit stops can be extremely deadly, and as long as they don't have to pit when other guys have to, they could stay out and wait for that caution to happen. So to your point, Scott, looks like the top four electing not to come down pit lane. Nick DeGroot, who came off pit road first, will restart fifth. He went with fuel only. Everybody else electing to put on some fresh tires here for this first restart of the evening. I was going to mention just before Jim Brooks ran into his problem, uh, the fact that Gail Brooks and Jim Brooks would love to see the top three have some issues here tonight, maybe not finish this race and be up there in the podium to gain points because they've still got a shot. 95 points back for Gail Brooks and 108 points back for Jim Brooks. And we have to remember that the upcoming season finale at Indianapolis is double points. So as long as they keep themselves mathematically in the hunt, they still might have a shot when we get there and double points per rounds that'll be on everyone's minds it's a, it's an alteration to the format um a little bit from from last season i mean we did obviously have a few double points rounds but what those races are and when they came during the season it changes year to year and it's something that a lot of the drivers may not necessarily contend with may not necessarily be thinking about etc 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 but double points is so critical to a championship you've got to show up on those rounds if you miss out on a double points round that can spell disaster for your season you've effectively had a poor finish at two rounds instead of just one i actually just forgotten next week in michigan's actually another double points race as well the three double points races here during the course of the schedule the other one of course was the season opener back at auto club and that was all about getting your season underway on the right foot. A lot of the drivers in the field, you know, had issues during Auto Club and they've had to fight their way back. Matt Wagner, actually, uh, one, of the, one of the big ones. who He's just had not had the season that he'd really like. He's had a season pretty much to forget straight out, right, Alex? And I mean, when, when the openers are double points around it, it mentally it's going to play on you even more throughout the season. I mean, yeah, for sure. Though the one advantage that Matt Wagner does indeed have, that he is sitting there still in third in the point standings. He may have lost a spot after the race last week but he's still here in contention he's not too far off that second position once again and if we get a couple solid nights say nick de groot does not have that good of a night tonight he could gain a lot of those points back interesting thing here that i've noticed as well we talk about it season after season when we see the champions get that trophy at the end of the season we talk about not only did they get the victories as we go back green but they also keep the consistency up in the races that they don't take checkered flags 
you look at our top three coming into tonight, and between Wagner, DeGruy, and Forsyth, there's not really been that consistency there. Granted, they've gotten those victories, but you look back at to Forsyth, he's had a ninth place finish back in the season opener, a 14th place finish for DeGruy back at Gateway, uh, two finishes outside of the top 10 for uh, Matt Wagner. Of course, we've documented the problem he had back in the season uh, second race at Las Vegas. And people might look back at that ninth place finish from Craig Forsyth and think, well, that's actually a good finish, right? That's inside the top 10. But based on the points payout here for the Indy cars, that actually puts you at a bit of a deficit to the rest of your competition. Yeah, but that's just how it... That's part and parcel of it. You as a driver, you just adjust to it. You're like, sometimes... Look, sometimes if nights, you know, all that I can walk away with, sometimes you just got to accept that. Could it, Was there anything more that I could have done? Was there anything more that I could have been, you know... What could I have done differently? A lot of the time with ovals, look at the speed of the cars are carrying. Look at how quickly they're getting around the racetrack. You kind of arrive on scene at a few of these incidents, and there's nothing you can do. You know, and that's just racing sometimes. So the fact that, that Craig has managed on those nights to walk away with a ninth place finish, that's actually a huge achievement. I think that cannot be understated. He's going to have another one of those fight back nights here tonight. He spun on that initial green flag, on that first go to the green when everyone was still double file. He was down on the grass. Now, he's back in the in the field. This is his opportunity. He has got to make spots through the field on this run. Oh, we got a car wrecked. That's Matt Wagner on the back straight away. Oh, Matt. I mean, his season is just going from, from bad to worse. I mean... Oh, he's just gotten on the throttle too hard. Alex, I mean, this is this is what you said. You were you were doing laps on the setup and it's it's tricky, it's difficult, and, and Matt Wagner's paid paid the uh the price for that one. Well, what from what I'm looking at from where Matt Wagner spun around, that's exactly the part of the racetrack where I was having the most trouble with is right there off turn two. You have those same problems there in the stock car as well. It's just the back end of the car gets really, really light as you go from the corner to the straightaway there off turn two. And that's exactly what you saw is he might have been on the throttle just a little bit too much. It snapped around on him and there he went. Remember, four drivers didn't come to pit road under the first caution. Wagner was one of them. So did that affect the grip he had there off that corner? Maybe something he hadn't felt in the first 10 laps. I would have reason to believe that most likely not. We're not seeing too many problems with tire wear, at least tonight, just because of the fact that these drivers are able to back off the corners a little bit, not putting too much strain on the front tires. But maybe what it could have been is just a matter of him being a little bit too comfortable and trying to get that extra little bit as he was losing a bit of time to the leaders, and maybe he just pushed it a little bit too hard. Wagner's come down. He's taken on his faster pair. Uh, interesting note, Jim Brooks, who brought out the first caution, actually did not take on his faster pair at that point in time. Did manual work on the car, lost a lap as a result, but the second caution coming out gets him the free pass and puts him back on the lead lap. And, you know, I, m I mentioned that wall there on the inside of the back straightaway. That is not a safe for Barry, and quite honestly, I think even if it was a safe for Barry, it would still do just as much damage to the front end, the front nose, the front wing of these cars. And with the fact now that, you know, drivers are having that issue off of turn two, if they have to use that mulligan in the first half of this race, just how much more are they going to be tiptoeing out of turn two to try and make sure that they keep that car in one piece and be around at the end? Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and, and Jim's a good driver in, in that respect. He's quite good at keeping the car underneath him, quite good at looking after things. And it's going to be a tricky race tonight. Uh, 21 laps in out of 140. We've had two cautions. You know, it, it, it's been difficult. When you see drivers like Matt Wagner and Craig Forsyth having issues, you know that it's tough on the drivers. The, these guys are experts. These are above their class they're heavily experienced these guys put the laps in matt wagner helps with building the setups for crying out loud i mean if, if he's having trouble you know it's difficult um so that says to me that i think jim brooks's call is the right call you've got to sit on that fast repair sometimes you're gonna to have to take the the hit to the pride the hit to the ego because it's the right decision for your race and i think he's doing that Yeah, that's something we're definitely going to have to be looking at tonight is going to be seeing what guys are forced to use their faster pair. We saw that there with Matt Wagner forced to use the faster pair in that instance because the front end of his race car was just destroyed. So 
for these guys who do end up wrecking tonight, it, the question is going to be, is my damage bad enough to take the faster pair, and how long away is the finish of the race, and can I risk not having it if I take it now? Now let's not forget, Richmond is considered a short track, and one thing we haven't touched on is usually at a short track, you want to have a good qualifying effort because you want that good starting track position. I mean, uh, so far with the two cautions, we haven't been able to really see if anyone can get up there and challenge Rick Ravon for the race lead, but uh, it certainly at least at the moment is looking like the clean air to the nose, that good starting track position has been important to the guys up here inside of the top three as we get ready to go back green. And important to note, when it goes back green there as well, Rick Ravon's restarting low on the track. Why is that? He wants as flat a surface as he possibly can. He wants room to be able to make a mistake getting back to the throttle. Restarting in an Indy car here is treacherous. You cannot just pick up the throttle aggressively. You've got to baby that thing. Yeah, that's one of the massive issues that I found this car is just getting up to speed in those low gears has very, very high torque and it's very rough on the rear tires. It's very, very easy to spin as we saw Craig Forsyth early on in the race do as well. It's so easy to do that. So what Ravon's doing is quite smart. Something I just noticed there in this battle for, I believe this is 10th between Matt Wagner and Jeff Heisong. Watch here on the back straightaway. Uh, we saw it with the far out shot down the backstretch last lap. This is not a smooth racetrack. These cars are kind of bouncing here on the racing surface, so that's got to be throwing off the handling as well. Yeah, but it's the same. It's consistent for all the drivers. It's, you know, it's just a, a feature of the racetrack that they're going to deal with. Any, like the bumps on the outside of uh, the entry to turn one and two at Iowa, like the bumps right the way around uh, Texas, like the bumps at Pocono, you know, it, it's just part and parcel of the racetrack. And, these drivers are going to learn to drive around it, and, you know, they're not going away. They're going to be there the whole race, so 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 figure it out, figure it out. You know, it doesn't mean you're taking a different line to avoid the bump if the bump's on the low side. doesn't mean you're attacking the corner differently. doesn't mean that you're setting up the corner. Maybe you're backing it up to make sure that, that you're off the throttle at the point oh, in... Oh, another! That's Gail Brooks! Great save. Great wow. save. Alec, that is quick hand handiwork, isn't it? No kidding, because that inside wall comes up on you in a hurry. Oh, yeah, for certain. He did the smartest thing you could do there. Just stamp the brake and straighten it out. There's really no other way to save that. So fantastic driving from Gail Brooks there. I think that's replay you know, worthy for sure. I, th I think the comparison I made last night when I was in the car in the IR18 League, this is the Bathurst of oval circuits because the walls, they're just there all the time. Wow, that is... <laughs> Oh, I see it, and I still don't believe it. One of those kind of things there for Gail Brooks. Nice job keeping his race alive. Almost became victim number three of turn number two here tonight. So, Alex, I mean, we've seen we've seen a couple drivers make those mistakes. Now, as as another driver, you haven't made those mistakes yet. Are you still taking note of what's going on there? Are you making predictions about what their cars are doing? How the car's oscillating? Maybe you're learning from that. Well, luckily, all these drivers are here on the same setup, so when they see somebody else make a mistake like that, they know their car is just as susceptible to it as they are. As I see him pass for, I believe, fifth position with Nick DeGroote. That's a driver I'm looking at right at the moment who seemed to have not made too many big mistakes but didn't have a good qualifying effort. Actually, didn't qualify at all. Started in the back. That was very fast in practice as looking away his move his way up the order. And indeed, he is now up inside of the top five. Craig Forsyth, second in points, trying to get up there. He's had his hands full, trying to get around Yari Brupacher for seventh place. You know, we've seen these drivers have these issues off of turn two. I mean, it might be a rhetorical question, but does it ever get better, or is it just going to constantly get worse? <laughs> oh, there's another one. That is Gary Corley in the seven facing the wrong way there on the inside line. No caution as yet. Oh, and he's got some pretty significant rear wing damage as well as the leaders are starting to come by. I think he may just bring it down the pit lane here just to stay out of the way of the leaders. So that'll end his night. That's disappointing. I mean, Coley's had a, had a rough couple of weeks as well, Alex. I mean, it, it's been pretty much a rough season from, from start to end for, for Gary. And oh, Mother there's Knight. another! Forsyth right in front of him! Yari Brubacher and there's oh, Wagner! Wagner. That's Wagner in there as well! That's job done. That is that is Matt Wagner's night over. 
That's two of your top three in points that were collected up in that one. Third caution of the night. Trying to look at what happened here. I think I'm seeing that uh, Yari Brewpacher spun around once again out of turn two, although a little bit earlier in the corner than I'm typically used to. I think what I'm seeing is that he hit the apron in the middle of turn two and it lost it right there. That was a big hit from Matt Wagner. He's just got piled into. Uh, that will be job done for Matt. There's there's no way that thing is getting back out on the track. My hard hit there, as you see, for the six. Forsyth oh, almost had goodness. it missed. He just got a little bit of damage in the right front wing. I thought he was going to avoid it, and then last second got clipped in the right rear. I'm just looking at Matt Wagner like, I, he, he just bounces down the track, man. I mean... How, how often it, do we talk about an airborne car at Richmond? Not often. And and the thing is, for Matt, is that um, his car's so, so heavily damaged that it's crabbing so much. His driving angle, he's got the steering wheel kanked full on the lock stops to the right-hand side, and it's going straight. <laughs> I've, I've really seen a car that damaged. Have you ever seen that, Alex? I've actually had that before, and it is a, a good sign that the car is most definitely destroyed. That is not what you want to see. I'll just take the hammer to it. It'll buff out. You're going to need about out, But I don't know how fast it's going to be afterwards. Look, look, they have these things out here called slide hammers. I don't know if you have them. They're just like a hammer on a slide. You use it for pulling the bodywork back out. If you wax with that, and you'll be right to go, right? Maybe if you I have know about the, ten of them. <laughs> I know that the one car that clobbered him was Jim Brooks. I think Jeff Heisong might have been the other one that got into him. So both of those drivers, obviously, with a ton of damage. That's going to take out actually quite a number of people because you've got Yari involved, you've got Craig involved. It'll be interesting to see whether both of those guys use their... If, if anyone's going to not need their, their fast repair, it'll be those two. Um, I think probably the best view of this crash all around is going to come from Jeff Hysong's cockpit because he's going to basically see it right at the edge of his view on, on corner exit and then sort of have to drive through it. So we saw there that Wagner, it looked like he had the wreck missed. He got to the outside of Brewpacher, spinning there on the back straightaway, but then got hit from behind. I mean, obviously, with the way that this short track runs, the progressive banking in the corners, the right front for sure, and I would assume as well the left front, a lot of tire heat built up. So how difficult is it when there's something literally right in front of you to be able to get on the brakes and avoid being involved in it? I mean, from what I understand, at least with these cars, is that you just can't hit the brakes that hard. If anything, they will lock up faster than you can even blink. You need to be very careful, and at that point, when you're that close to the wreck, there's not much else you can really do about it. Well, I mean, it also comes down to the amount of speed that these guys are carrying. Obviously, we've, we've talked, uh, I think, at length about the amount of downforce that they generate, so there is actually a lot of grip there. Um, an ability for the drivers to apply the brakes, but it, it's about the application method, which I think is what Alex was referring to. Um, you can't just stamp on them. You've got to lift off, but the, the benefit is that they do have a lot of air braking coming from that level of downforce. more downforce you have, the more drag you're creating, the more that the car will slow as soon as you lift off the throttle. Uh, Jeff's also got a responsibility to try and dodge the accident for himself, so he does stay on the gas a little bit. He's expecting the cars to rotate back up the track. It, it's just a difficult situation as we go back there back underway here at Richmond as we are now more than a third of the way through this race. Uh, update on drivers involved in the three previous cautions. Matt Wagner's evening is done. He will finish 12th place here tonight. Yari Brewpacher took on his faster pair under that last yellow. He's the last car on the lead lap. Gary Corley, who we saw have an issue but no caution, came out to save him. He lost two laps when coming down pit road, took on his faster pair. He got one of those back here. So he is the only car running one lap down in 11th place as Alpha the lead might be heating up. This is about the closest we've seen Luis Gonzalez Nunez be able to stay with Rick Ravon. Yeah, this is the first time that Luis has actually managed to make his way past Eric Peterson. 
you know, Peterson's had a few weeks out and family issues and, you know, all power to, to Eric and, and what he's gotten through over the last couple of weeks. And, and congratulations to him for, for rejoining the season in, in, in such a manner. But Luis Gonzalez has been a man on a mission. He, he's really been trying to get his way up there. And the last time, like I said earlier in the piece, the last time we were at a short track, he was the man. He had control of the field. He qualified on pole. He led the bulk of the race. And then he just let lap traffic get to him. We'll see if Rick Ravon has an impact on this guy. Well, something interesting. I am watching some of the cockpit cameras. And I'm seeing that Nunez is definitely having to back up the corner a lot more right in the center of the corner where you need the downforce the most. And that's where he's losing most of the time there to Rick Ravon ahead of him, especially down here in the turns one and two. He really struggles to get it down at the speed he may want. So that's the advantage of being the leader, is being able to stay in the throttle a bit longer in the center. No surprise, as we saw the onboard there with the 14 running in fifth gear. Draft, not really that much of a factor, just based on the fact that there's really not that long of straightaways here at Richmond. Well, I mean, the front stretch isn't even a straightaway. It's curved the whole way around. That can sneak up on you. Um, the the outside barrier towards the tail end of the straight can actually get a little bit uh, camouflaged, I guess, just because it's it's stripy the whole way down. You're running past it at such a speed, it sometimes it does actually make you a little bit dizzy. So that's that's something the drivers will have to deal with as well, particularly those that are running on, on VR headsets. I know that Matt Wagner was one that is. Rick Ravon's another. So that's something they'll have to manage throughout the race. One driver we haven't talked about yet tonight that has run into any issues is the points leader, Nick DeGroot. Wagner out of the race. Forsyth has a little bit of damage and is running back in seven. So now I think at the moment for Nick DeGroot, it's just make sure you don't put a wheel wrong like others have here tonight and get yourself uh, at least a decent points evening, even if you don't win the race. Carry yourself a little bit more of an advantage into the double points race next week. Yeah, I mean, it's setting up the season, setting up your championship. Remember what I said again earlier, uh, a fourth place finish from Nick DeGroote is now actually a very good point tonight for him. He's going to put points over Craig Forsyth. He's going to put a mass of points over Matt Wagner, and that actually may spell doom for Matt Wagner's season. If he can show up tonight and just say, hey, look, I don't have the pace to keep up with Rick. I don't have the pace to keep up with Luis. Maybe I'll make that move later on on Eric Peterson. That's a third place finish. We're still talking to him on the podium. That's still a phenomenal run for him. He hasn't got to overcome these sorts of difficulties, and I think he actually just sent it. I think he's got the move done now. And I think he got a little help. Oh, got a car hard in the wall back there. That's Jim Herrick in the 40, who was running in the fifth position. Is he still on the inside of the track? He is, and he is now teleported back to pit road. Looked like that car couldn't even refire. No caution, however. Alex, sometimes when you're in, when you're in the car and, and crew chief calls out to you and he says, "Hey, that we've got a car in the fence. It's potentially going to be a caution. Keep your eyes out for it." You lift off a little bit, and now these drivers have put the hammer back down. It, it, it takes a little bit out of you. Sometimes you lose that margin. You lose focus for a few moments. I mean, at least in my case, I don't slow down until the caution is actually out. So oh, Rayvon! Rayvon just lost it off a of turn two from the lead. There's the caution. Didn't hit anything. Nice job getting on the brakes, but yellow flag, your point going to fly at the completion of lap 60. Rick Ravon is going to lose the lead for the first time here tonight. Shows that no matter where you're running in this field here this evening, drivers are still out there on pins and needles. Oh man, that was that was intense. I, I can't believe that he's lost that from that position. He's going to be back in the pack for the first time tonight, and he's going to have a job to do. I mean, honestly, guys, I, I'm shocked. I mean, from his position, he was pulling away. He didn't need to drive that hard. It just goes to show how difficult this setup is, is that even the leader, with how much advantage he had, is still spinning and making mistakes. Look at the cars making a play for track position. This is important right here. You've got three cars up at the front. One of them uh, that didn't pit. One of them is actually the lucky dog, which is going to be Jeff uh, Song. He's going to get a lap back here. But the two leaders, Luis Gonzalez Nunez and, and Eric Peterson, both of them have gone, track position is so critical. I cannot afford to pit at this point in time. Everyone else says, hey, I'm going to make a play for track position later on by playing fuel mileage. 
Yeah, it looks like to me Rick Ravon got very lucky here. The back end of the car seemed to want to step out a lot earlier on him than it has for others. Uh, kind of gave him a little bit of a warning there to then be able to get on the brakes. I think that other drivers, they've been clobbering that inside wall because they just haven't had enough time to be able to react when the back end snaps. I mean, it's all a matter of just how much throttle you're putting down. I mean, we've noticed almost every single wreck so far has happened right there off turn two. I can't emphasize enough how difficult that corner is for these guys. It feels almost painful to run through there without spinning it around because you want to get on the throttle. You think you can, and then suddenly the back end just slides right out on you. Even the leader is susceptible to that. You know, Scott, you were talking about the fact, I think it was last night, uh, a number of these drivers, including yourself, took to Richmond. And, you know, obviously drivers here in the field tonight, they're familiar with this racetrack. They may even be familiar with these particular cars at this racetrack. But being the first time that this has appeared on the schedule for the Dark Horse Racing Series, is that playing in any way a factor into these drivers having the struggles here tonight? Um. Look, I mean... They, the, the thing is, in terms of how they do the setups, the Dark Horse car is the DW12. It hasn't had aero package updates for a long time. iRacing doesn't update these cars um, that frequently, if at all, um, because they are a legacy vehicle. They're no longer receiving updates. You know, They're no longer trying to patch it towards to where they're trying to fix issues. The car's in a pretty stable state. Then you come to a track that you don't have a setup for. Then you come to a track... The guys haven't ran in these cars in a long time. So yes, the IR18 League will definitely help, and and a lot of these drivers will have that experience, but they can get that experience through practice sessions. These setups, they're out a couple days in advance, their drivers are able to put the laps in, they're not able to put the laps in in terms of traffic management. So that's a little bit different. It's a tricky track, an unstable setup, things just aren't going to plan at this point in time, and, you know... We're seeing the mistakes left, right, and center. Honestly, I, I just think that uh, it's a very difficult track to build a setup for that's stable. Because you're going to find either the car doesn't turn or it turns too much. And that's what we're getting is, is basically the transition of weight towards the mid and exit of the corner. Is the car's just turning a little bit too much. And the other option is the car doesn't turn at all, which makes pretty much the leader gets control of the field. No one can ever overtake, and it's so much difficult more difficult this setup we're at least seeing some racing yeah there's some cautions but you know that's just part and parcel is coming to some of these short tracks well as we've seen here the leaders are starting to come back here to the green flag nunez the front two it did not pit on the last time as nunez takes the green flag and gets a good jump there on this on second position eric peterson and just behind them nick de Groot on the fresh tires we'll have to see how that works out for him yeah, Nunez coming into this race sixth in the point stands, only 117 points out. And of course, with still two double points races left to run, I mean, he still would have a mathematical shot. And boy, what a what a jump it would be on the road to trying to get up to the points lead if he could take his first checkered flag of his career here tonight. And I mean, he's led races this season. It just hasn't gone his way. This is a tricky setup. This is going to take some management from him. And I really want to see that development. He's an amazing driver. He's so, so talented. He's been in and around IndyCars for such a long period of time before joining this league. So even though we've only seen little bits and pieces of him, he should have those talents. I was really disappointed in the performance I saw out of him um, at Homestead. And I'm, I'm honestly banking that he gets the job done tonight because I really want to see that from him. In fact, he's just set the fastest lap of the race. Did indeed. Only car here tonight that is, well, actually, correction, he's one of two cars that have uh, broken into the 15 nines. A 9.15 for Gonzalez, a 9.16 for Rick Ravon, who up until Gonzalez took the lead had been leading. Let's follow up on him right now in that fifth position. And, you know, he was out in clean air. Didn't have to worry about anybody in front of him. Really didn't have any challenge out, out back. And now he's got to completely change the way he approaches this race because of the change of positioning. Yeah, I mean, for the case of Rick Ravon right now, we know he has pace. We know he has speed. It's just a matter of how much speed does he have in traffic. It's a totally different driving style back here. You just have to back up those corners and try and get the runs off. But as we've seen off turn two, trying to get the run off the corner, it can be a little bit dangerous. That's probably why we're seeing so many guys behind the leader struggle to make up any time and struggle to make passes.
Nunez yeah, continuing with... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Seth. I was, go ahead. I was just going to... I was just going to mention the fact here that, you know... I think Alex touched on it, the fact of how treacherous this pit lane is to get onto under green flag conditions. Yes, this was a great play for track position for Nunez and Peterson to stay out. Right now, by the calculations, they're only about, what, maybe 15 laps away from when they're going to have to come to pit lane. Oh, uh, yeah. maybe not, because Nunez is going to loop it from the lead. So that's wow. the second time in a row that we've seen drivers on older tires loop it in the fresh air. But not the drivers that are struggling in behind them. I, that says to me that's actually a rear tire overheating issue. Which means that they're going to have to manage throttle pressure even more. You're also saying that uh, Alex made the, made the comment of, you know, these guys are, are pushing quite aggressively. They're, they're, they're trying to build that margin, run away with it a little bit. Maybe it is time to back it down. Nick DeGroote, remember, he's in a championship fight. He's been sitting here. He's been watching a lot of this. He's got pit again. No, no, great fake. Great fake from, from Nick. Jim Herrick's going to get the lucky dog under this caution. He was four laps down, so he will now be at three. Uh, he's the last car running. Gary Corley joins Matt Wagner back in the garage area. That was two cautions ago that he came down and headed for the infield. And, well, back-to-back -back cautions where the race leader goes around, but also back-to-back -back spins where both drivers don't hit anything. Uh, Gonzalez Nunez a little bit closer to the inside wall than Rick Ravon was, but at least both of those drivers, the car is still intact. They still have that faster pair mulligan available to them. Kind of a live-to-fight-another-day scenario for both of them, but at the same time, both of them loss of track position. You know, something I, I'm seeing, for one, I want to make the comment of Eric Peterson staying out still. I mean, he's... 37 laps in this stint, 38 as we cross the line. Now, granted, he's going to be saving a little extra fuel because of these caution laps. So I imagine he'll be able to get it to the early to maybe mid-50s on laps on this stint. But I'm just confused about this play because, I mean, we've been seeing cautions come out pretty quick, but you're really gambling on that this late in the stint. And another thing while I was looking at all the other wrecks that have happened off turn two here the biggest thing i've noticed is that as they're going through the corner they're taking their lines low through the center and that's when they're snapping off i've noticed more normally they're taking a wider arc down to straighten out the exit and when they're not straight that's what i'm noticing they're getting loose But that's just, that's typical, I mean, in terms of road course, I mean, Alex, you, you, you're this oval guy. Let, let me talk to you about the road course stuff. I'm going to teach you a lesson here about turning rights, okay? So what it is, is, uh, and for the fans out there that are, that are watching as well, it's all about making sure that your throttle pressure matches the steering input that you've got. What we see in a lot of cars these days is they've got more downforce than the cars actually do have in terms of power. So the tires, they're able to pick up the throttle completely and only aggressively before that wheel is completely straight. Now, this is the part where Alex will get it. A lot of stock cars these days have got a lot more power than they do downforce. That means that your throttle control and your throttle ability and your technical ability with how you drive the car has got to be higher. Indy cars are a little bit in the, in the middle. Sometimes they do have the downforce, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they've got less downforce at the rear because that's the way they're trying to turn the car. They want a little bit of down, they want a lot of downforce at the front and they want a little bit of downforce at the rear to help the car actually swing around the corner. Also it helps the car go start fast in a straight line. Now, in this case, the drivers are also dealing with a transition from a curved surface or a non-flat, a bank surface here, back to a flatter surface. Bank surface is very, very good for helping the tires maintain a contact patch throughout an elongated corner. That's why we see bank surfaces in a lot of the ovals. The guys are running at such high speeds. They're struggling to maintain that contact surface. You bank the surface up, it means that the car is leaning in the direction of the turn. You can carry more speed through it. But at some point... That's got to come back to near flat at particular tracks. Doesn't happen everywhere, obviously. Some tracks don't run with that. That's what's happening here. You're getting that transition back to a flat surface, and that's where the cars are losing. I'm ready to go back green. I just want to build off of that there, Scott, and ask you, I mean, 
you know, eight degrees of banking here on the front straight, but only two degrees of banking over on the back stretch. Is that why we're seeing all of our issues off of turn two rather than off of turn four? Because there's that little bit of extra banking off the final corner for these drivers to lean on. Yeah, it means the banking transition going back to two degrees is a lot steeper than going back to only to eight degrees. So the banking in the turns, a little bit higher. Coming back to two degrees is a huge transition back to that flat surface, and that's where the guys are losing it. Eric Peterson, you saw there with those older tires, uh, he was not able to run nearly as low through three and four as Nick DeGroote. And all of a sudden, the uh, battle up there with the two remaining drivers in the top three in the points has now become nose to tail. Second place to group, Craig Forsyth right there in the third spot, about maybe four or five car lengths off. Alex, again, you've been in these sorts of situations in the past. Does that temper your ability to or your drive to go for an aggressive move? Are you going to go hunting somebody because they're a championship rival? Because particularly, in, I believe Nick DeGroote's actually leading the points, so it's critical for Craig Forsyth to beat him here. I mean, yeah, I've been in plenty of scenarios where I'm racing around guys I'm trying to beat in points. I mean, you know, I've been in plenty playoff level situations where you got to beat a certain amount of guys to make it into that group or maybe nab a win or something like that. And in the case of Craig Forsythe, this would be a position that I'd be in. And I'm like, I got to get up there. I got to get to the group because if he gets the pass for the lead, it's going to be just that much harder to catch him. So I'm just thinking, got to get him now, got to get him now. And for DeGroote, it's the polar opposite. It's I'm the points leader. I'm already ahead of my competition. I don't need to go for the lead, but if I get the chance to, it's going to make things a lot easier. But you've got those two double points races still waiting in the wings. Michigan next week and then in three weeks, Indianapolis. So does that in any way maybe change your decision to get up there? Because granted, yes, DeGroote, if he won this race, would gain points on you. So he's actually going to go for the race lead here into turn three. But you've got two races with double points to try and make up that deficit. And certainly being double points, that would be possible, I would think, if you can at least finish in the same vicinity as Nick DeGroote here tonight. I mean, that's the thing, right? You know, if he's finishing ahead of you, he's still gaining points on you, no matter how small it is, and he's already got such a massive gap. But yeah, those double points races do provide an opportunity, but the opportunity has to be Nick DeGroote messing up in that race, allowing you to oh! gain Oh! Gail Brooks, another great save off of two. Sorry to cut you off. Thought we were about to have another driver with an issue. That's, that's two for two there for the 71 here tonight. I mean, it's two in turn two as well. Yeah. Two, two, two. I mean, clearly Guy o Brooks has got something figured out because he's been the only driver tonight to get the car loose and end up saving it. So I think some of these guys need to take a couple lessons here from, from Gail to figure out how to drive this car off turn two. Make I'll give you route. something. I'm, uh, I'm quite good at saving wrecking cars. You know why? Because I've had so much practice wrecking cars. <laughs> You got to be there to be able to learn, right? <laughs> That's it. That's it. Hey, so he was the on way, the boys, move. Rick hey, Ravon. Yeah, Ravon. I was about to mention, he found his way up into the third position. He's running down Eric Peterson for the second spot. Ravon's back in the fight for the lead up here. And while Nick DeGroote's pulling away, Ravon's saying not so fast. He's coming up here to get the, the positions he needs to battle for that lead. Standing out to me right now. Clean air, Nick DeGroote ran a 16.2. In traffic, Ravon ran a 16.1. That last time by, he was a thousandth quicker as now he'll move into second spot. I think it was critical. Oh, Gael just had another big moment off of turn two. He is struggling with that car. I think Gael just needs to calm it down. Just those tires are definitely really, really overheated in the rear, and that's just going to make things worse and worse. So he's just going to have to relax that we don't bring out a caution here. So what can you do from the driver's seat when those rear tires are heated up and you keep feeling that snappy loose sensation off the corner? Is there anything you can do here on the long run to kind of remedy that problem? It's one of the most painful things, but really you just can't hit the throttle. I mean, what, another thing you could try and do is a little bit of a method of going into the corner a little bit harder, but being on the brakes while also on the throttle to put more wear into the front tires so that you're not putting so much on the rear tires. But either way, one, you're running a lot slower, and the other one, you're burning up your fronts. But that's really all you can do. 
Uh, 10 out of 10 there for Eric Peterson. Got onto pit road safely from what was then a battle for the fourth position between himself and Jim Brooks. But now he's got to hope that this thing either goes green to the end or maybe nobody else falls a lap down. A caution comes out for him to get the free pass because there's no doubt he's going to lose at least one lap, maybe two, with how quickly they get around this short track. I mean, there yeah, is... Yeah, look, I mean... Oh, he's... No, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll go ahead. Fine. Where Eric Peterson's pitting right now, he can make it to the end of the race on fuel, so he does not need to pit again. But that's what you're saying about it needing to stay green. If this stays green, he actually might have a shot at the win here as he might have some better pace on new tires and has enough fuel to make it to the finish. I mean, that, that was the reason for the, the critical lap number, right? I mean, he had to get to a minimum window in terms of fuel. These cars don't have engine maps. They The only way you can save fuel is lifting and coasting. We've seen a die off in terms of Eric Peterson's pace. I'm wondering whether or not he went, oh, I've got to get to this window. Let's see how we can go ahead and do that. Now, one thing that's playing a big factor into Rick Ravon's ability to cut his way through the field and start to eat into Nick DeGroote's lead, there's about 15 laps difference between the tires on the 89 and the tires on the 1. That's obviously going to translate into speed. So when Nick Rick Ravon gets up there to Nick DeGroote, just, just how much mirror driving does DeGroote do? Or does he say, all right, you got the faster car, go on by me? Because, again, the big talking point we've had here tonight is just how hard are you willing to push? Well, and the other side of the coin is, have a look at Eric Peterson now. He's just come out, he's got fresh tyres, he's got to try and hunt that lap back. You know, he's got to go gangbusters because this is his best opportunity to go as hard and as fast as he can whilst he's still got the tyres underneath him and give himself a shot. A little bit of a mystery here to me is Jim Brooks. Great job working his way back up to the fourth position. He was the first driver we saw run into trouble here. 10 laps into this evening's festivities. He actually just now moved his way up to the fourth position as Forsyth has either gone around or nearly went around on the back straightaway. No, actually, he's coming to pit road. He was just slowing it down there on the apron. But Brooks, he did. He clobbered the inside wall with the front end of his race car, but he has not up to this point taken on a faster pair. So pretty impressive that they were able to put the new front clip on that race car and that engine apparently is still up to speed enough to have him now up inside the podium. Yeah, sometimes you get lucky in terms of where the, uh, where the damage and whatnot is and on the car and, and how it's affecting you. And I think he's one of those cases tonight. He, he's gotten a little bit lucky in terms of how the damage has affected his race car. It's not, it's not consistent sometimes. It takes some specific impacts in specific places to cause things to happen in a specific way. And he, Oh, Peterson! And of course, Peterson is the cause of that caution, which means he won't get any laps back. He'll get one lap back at most. And I'll tell you, did not want to see that caution? Craig Forsyth, because I think what he was doing when he came to pit lane was trying to force the hand of Nick DeGroote. Yeah, I'm watching here on the replay for Eric Peterson. It looks like, similar to an incident we saw earlier in the race, he just nicked the apron just a little bit there in turn two, and that spun him around. He was driving the thing as damn well hard as he could. You know, he, he, he was aware that this was his opportunity to get himself ahead. Well, it didn't work out his way. Peterson right. now three laps down. Forsyth will get the lucky dog. He'll get one of the two laps back that he lost with his green flag pit stop. And oh, Scott, even going back to the beginning of the season, back at Auto Club, we saw the pit road gamesmanship between drivers like DeGroote and uh, Forsyth and Matt Wagner. I remember in that Auto Club race, what was it? I think it was one lap after Forsyth came to pit road, DeGroote came to pit road, was able to take on a little less fuel, and that translated into him being able to take the checkered flag. I mean... We've seen it all season long. These guys have really been utilizing pit road strategy into uh, their ways of battling each other for positions on track and ultimately checkered flags. Yeah, and how critical is that? I mean, you know, looking looking after the car, keeping yourself alive, keeping yourself within the race is, you know, there's not much more you can really do. Well, I hate to interrupt you all, but we've had a 
grand development here on the pit lane. Rick Ravon has taken the lead on the pit exit through the pit cycle away from Nick DeGroote. So Rick Ravon is now our leader. Had that number two pit stall with his qualifying effort. DeGroote was all the way back uh, in the 11th pit stall. So that could certainly have played a part into it as well. But now it's going to be interesting to see Ravon back out in clean air. Dominated the early going. Nick DeGroot was back in traffic, had to fight his way up from a starting position outside of the top 10. Also gave up some track position under a couple of those cautions to come down and either top off the fuel tank or put on fresh tires. Now it's going to be interesting to see mono e mono these two on an equal footing because both of them came down and took on fresh tires under this pit stop. And they've been the quickest drivers, and they've cut their way through the field. The only difference here is that uh, Luis Gonzalez Nunez is probably one of the quicker drivers as well. Is He's in fourth. He's got to clear Jim Brooks before he can actually get involved in this fight. This will be one of the first times that uh, Nick DeGroote will have a crack at the lead. Uh, other than that, I think he's just earned the lead just by being that clean driver. I think the, I think the situation is going to completely and utterly change for him. I mean... At least in my opinion, I believe if Rick Ravon does not make a mistake here, he's had the pace to just lead the field by a massive margin. So as long as he doesn't make a mistake like he did earlier in the race, I think he's got it set for the checkered. But I mean, he has made that mistake, so that'll be on his mind as well. I Absolutely. Mean, yeah, for sure, because, I mean, Nick DeGroote behind him actually has been one of the few clean drivers tonight. He's not made a mistake so far. Almost every other driver in the field has slipped up, spun around, done something so far this race. Nick DeGroote being the only exception of that. So he's got that bit of an, a mental advantage inside of him right now. But as the pressure comes near, as we're nearing just about 20 laps to go, 25 at the moment, it's going to be rough for him and rough for Rick Ravon, who did make a mistake. Ten drivers still running in the closing stages of tonight's race at Richmond. Seven of them currently on the lead lap. Craig Forsyth is the only car one lap down, so any future caution would put him back on the lead lap, provided he is not the next caution. Eric Peterson and Jim Herrick, they will try and settle it out for the ninth position, both of them running three laps down. The... Field back in the hands of Rick Ravon, who does that patented move down to the inside, coming to the start-finish line. Look at that. Already five, six car lengths advantage going into turn one. That's the thing. He's got to be hugely adva advantageous. He's got to get aggressive. Look oh, at the guys getting man. aggressive behind him. That was almost three wide going into turn three. Nunez showed the nose up there right against the wall. All of them had to make late decisions to, to be a little bit more patient, a little bit checked up. You know how it is. It's, it's not that simple when they've all come away with it. It's tricky at this point in time. These cars are running 180 mile an hour. They're getting close to 200 mile an hour. They're not quite getting getting right there uh, this season out. But, uh, you know, they're getting close. And it's just a short track. Everything comes up on you so much quicker. I mean, something that isn't going to be coming up quicker for Rick Ravon is any competitors because he's already got eight, nine tenths of a lead right now after the mistakes from Nick DeGroote on the initial start and the absolute fantastic jump for Ravon. Ravon is pretty much in the clear right now. The big thing that we talk about, especially at the speedway, Scott, is momentum. You end up having to bail out of the throttle. There's another five, six guys behind you that are willing to pounce and take advantage. Is momentum important here tonight, or could Rick Ravon back it off just a little bit here, especially when he gets around that turn two area to make sure it's planted, or can Nick DeGroote, if Ravon does that, be able to take advantage? Uh, momentum isn't as critical here as, as you might think. Yeah, sure, it's tough to bring that momentum back, but ultimately, it's all about setting up your corner exits, making sure that you're carrying... You can only be fast here in one phase of the corner. You can't be fast on entry and fast on exit. You've got to pick one. And you've got to pick the one that keeps you ahead of the guy behind. Nick DeGroote's coming. He's closed down that margin to Rick Ravon. Ravon's now going to keep an eye on his rearview mirror and decide how best he can deal with this threat. Now, something I've been watching a little bit is that Nick DeGroote has been running some pretty rapid lap times. He did catch up just a little bit there on Rick Ravon. Now, that could just be Rick Ravon taking it a little bit more careful, but DeGroote is running some pretty solid lap times. 
Now, one thing I heard earlier on tonight is, you know, these cars... Oh, got a caution. I think it was Peterson again, the 36. That's going to tighten the field up, and Nick DeGroot would have seen that restart from Rick Ravon last time by. He'll be ready for it this time. And it was interesting, about three laps ago, all drivers inside the top four ran lap times within eight one-hundredths of each other. So they're all pretty much, in terms of speed, all on equal footing. And uh, now we're going to be getting ourselves into shootout territory here this evening. Oh, don't tell me. Yeah, there's no way Nick DeGroote's going to do that. No way. He can't. He's never getting that track position back. <laughs> there is no way that Nick DeGroote comes down pit road here. It's oh. a good thing you're not out on the track, Scott. He's faked you out twice. Oh, man. Oh, Alex, I mean, uh, talk us through the pit lane fake. It's, it's an important and critical uh, thing that the drivers need to be able to do and need to know when to do it. And tonight, well... Like, like Seth just said, that's the second time he sold me the dummy. I mean, I, I knew he wasn't going to do that. I think that one was almost just for funsies to see if somebody would take it. Because at this point in the race, everybody's good on fuel. The tires don't fall off enough. I don't think there's any reason for anybody to pit from here on out unless you're right in the back. Yeah, we saw almost three wide that second position on that last restart lap is that a precursor of what we're going to be seeing here i mean i think we might be getting back green before we hit 10 to go but even so i mean potentially could be getting ready for our last restart of the night i'd, I'd say this is it i'd say this is going to be our last restart i think you hit the nail on the head i think 10 to go these guys are capable of getting green that long remember if they get down to the closing phases and they've only got a couple laps left they can't get back to green They're basically this caution has got to happen in two or three laps or else where where that's it race over well craig forsyth gave up a lot of track position under that one green flag run to make a pit stop lost two laps gained one back under the last caution gets the second one back here under caution number seven so he will be the eighth and final car on the lead lap when we go back green uh, i guarantee you he is going to be taking no prisoners and trying to work his way back up here towards the front but all right, I want to go back to what you were talking about with Nick DeGru, noticing what Rick Ravon did on that last restart. What are some of the things as a driver that Nick DeGru can do to make sure he keeps touch with the one car? Or with the fact that Ravon is the control machine, is DeGru basically just kind of hands tied and hope he gets as good a restart as possible? Alex, I'll pass this one to you, man. You're, you're more experienced in this than I am. I mean, I... I... So far, all the restarts we've seen tonight, Rick Ravon has just pulled away from the entire field. So I think Rick Ravon's got it pretty much covered in terms of the restarts. And once you pull out that certain distance, it's really hard to catch you and run you down. I mean, we saw Ravon do it to the rest of his competition, but so far tonight, we've seen nobody else do it to him. Scott, you talked oh. about Rick Ravon, you know, about 20 laps ago, had to keep in the back of his mind. He'd already made one mistake off of turn two from the race league, could not afford to do it again. That's out of his mind now, right? I mean, basically, you can't be thinking about that at this point in time. No, you've got to be aggressive. You, you've got to go out there. You've got to go. you got to get it. And, you know, there's uh, there's not much more that's, uh, that you can really do with that. You you have to be the driver that's that's going to be in it to win it. And if you're not, it's it's too late for that. you you got to go now. Go now. A few comeback stories in the field here tonight. Ravon back up to the race lead after he spun from there. Luis Gonzalez Nunez spun from the race lead. He's up to the fourth spot. Jeff Hysong was involved in that big wreck on the back straightaway. He's up inside the top five and fifth. Green flag back in the air. Officially 10 to go here tonight at Richmond. I mean, once again, Rick Ravon, fantastic restart, pulls away from the field and battle there for the third position between Jim Brooks and Nunez. Trying to race side by side there for a second. Jim Brooks washes up a little bit, and that's going to cut off Nunez. But, man, they're racing hard right now, too wide into turn one. Got to be aggressive. You got to get out there. You got to go hard for the position. Luis is doing that. Just keep your eyes on him. Look at how he offsets himself. He's going to run a different line for a different reason this time. Sends it down into turn one. About a car length and a half between those two for the final spot on the podium here tonight. 
little less than a second between Rick Ravon back to Nick DeGroote, then another half second back to this battle for third place, which might end up turning into a three or maybe even four car fight. There you see Jeff Hysong and Gail Brooks starting to close in. Something's happened there. Something happened to Craig Forsyth. He just got in, into a into a biffo, I believe, with Yari Brew Parker. We're gonna stay green. There's two cars that are slow, and it is Forsyth and Brew Parker. It is indeed, and I think Gail Brooks might have gotten loose off of turn two. Might have had another save here this evening. Five to go as Rayvon hits the line this time by. Still about nine tenths of a second. Cut it down to maybe eight and a half tenths. Back to Nick DeGroote, but DeGroote's running out of time. Yeah, he is. He's got to get on it. And uh, the threat of another caution is is the other thing that, that's absolutely critical. You can't just let it settle. You can't just let it go. you got to go for it. Obviously, we know Nick DeGroote wants to add another checkered flag to what's already been an incredible Dark Horse Racing Series career. But at the same time, you mentioned one of those drivers in that incident was his competition, Craig Forsyth. So are you willing to just settle for a second place run here tonight? Because you're going to gain a ton of points. Oh, it's tough. It's it, Honestly, I can't tell you. I really cannot tell you, Seth. I, I don't know what to say, man. I just don't. Nick DeGroote, uh, he'd want to go for the win. He would 100% he would want to go for the win. Salas Nunez wants to go for third. This is going to be the battle to the checkers, I think, for this final spot on the podium. Nunez trying every which way he can to get around Jim Brooks as Rick Ravon comes around to see the white flag. He's too far back, so it's not on for DeGroote. Now it's on to Gonzalez Nunez. Can he send it under Brooks? He's, oh, he's he, got he loose. lost too much momentum. He lost too yep. much momentum. He's going to lose another spot. Going to lose at least fourth, maybe fifth. Rick Ravon in his return to the series. The defending champion gets another checkered flag, and tonight it's at Richmond International Raceway. Yeah, what a run. What a run. I mean, that was intense racing. We saw it last week from... Uh, from the the champion you know he finished second he went he went hard at craig forsyth it was close you know it wasn't simple it wasn't easy in any stretch of the imagination but man he worked for every little bit of that i mean hey, one of the, sorry good one of the keys i think tonight for rick ravon winning was just figuring out something that the rest of the competition did not have tonight because he no matter where he was on the racetrack in front in the pack it didn't matter he seemed to just have something figured out that nobody else had and that's what i'm curious to ask him about it just kind of seems like the the moniker for the last few weeks has been never give up i mean you go back to last week charles t visited all three stories of the catch fence on the back straightaway was up in the conversation for the victory bringing it home in um, the top five, and here tonight, Rick Ravon, dominant in the early going, spun from the race lead, fell back to around fifth, sixth position, didn't give up, worked his way back up to the front, and once he got the race lead in that clean air, once again, never looked back. Yeah, and that's that's what it's come down to for Rick Ravon, and I mean, you got to look at it this way, He's he's been out for work, he's had nothing that he can really do with that, and now he's back. Now he's hungry. Now he's doing whatever he can because he's out here for fun. He's just competing for single one-off results. He doesn't care about anything else. He's got no reason to care about anything else because, well, this is it. This is this is all he needs to care about. Doing some victory laps here around Richmond International. Let's take a look at the finishing results here tonight and... I don't know, maybe one of the more grueling races from a driver's point of view that we've seen here all season. Uh, very few drivers had a clean night without putting a wheel wrong. Nick DeGroote might have been the only one here this evening as he'll finish second. Big points night for him with Craig Forsyth finishing down in eighth. But, but Jim Brooks up there in the third spot brought out the first caution. He gets a podium finish. Great battle there between him and Luis Gonzalez Nunez who was able to hang on to fourth place. Jim Hysong, Gail Brooks going to be 5th and 6th. Jim Herrick finished the race off the lead lap in 7th. And then these other drivers finished back in the garage area or on pit road at the close of this race. Forsyth, Rupacher, Eric Peterson, Gary Corley. On oh, the big one there, Matt Wagner. I mean, I guess the good news for him is he's got two double points races to be able to build off of in the next three weeks. But certainly not the finish he was looking for here tonight, especially with the momentum he had coming into this evening. I mean, who would? 
who would want to finish the the a, a race like that it's nothing much he could have done just wrong place wrong time and you know a tough race it's been a tough season and sometimes it just doesn't go your way things aren't repetitively not going his way has basically been the course of his season and it's just another one that's got away from him i i don't know what to tell you man it's 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 tough to be matt wagner right now that much is for sure Well, we see if we can go down trackside, see if we can talk with some of these drivers here this evening that were able to finish up inside the podium. Let's kick things off with tonight's third place finisher, Jim Brooks. Hey, Jim, it's Alex Scott and Seth up here in the FRM booth. You got us? I do. Well, your evening didn't exactly start off the way you planned, looping around there in turn two, but a lot of drivers had issues with that here this evening. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, tough in the early going. What was it like trying to keep your head in the game, realize it was still a long ways to go, and then in the end of the night, be able to bring that thing home on the podium? Yeah, that worked out pretty well. But to my defense, um, what happened is my tear-off button is right next to my recenter. I'm in VR recenter button and i hit it instead of the tear off so it made my view down into the right so i was telling gael it was like being a six-year-old trying to look over the stern wheel so <laughs> before i could get it back to where it needed i ended up spinning off of so you didn't see me spin really anymore after that so <laughs> but yeah it was tough i mean this car putting the power down and trying to turn are not two things that go together Oh, that's that's a classic. A six-year-old trying to stand up and look over the steering wheel, man. Uh, yeah, that's that's a difficult way to, to drive what was already a difficult setup. Uh, wasn't easy <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, and uh, that, that certainly made it tougher. It was about race management tonight. You did a phenomenal job in, in terms of managing your own race. It was a tricky setup. It was a tricky track, and that's two nights in a row that I think we've seen uh, a lot of good drivers struggle, and, and that... Oh, it's just, it's so hard when you come to Richmond in these cars. I agree a hundred percent. And it's that trying to race hard kind of thing. I mean, you can do it in one and two, I mean, in three and four, but one and two, you try to race that corner hard, especially two, and you're going to be spinning out. And yeah, it was the same last night. It seemed like. Alex, well, I think I you got the final call of the night. The final yeah. question for him. Yeah, one of the things that I found interesting tonight was just how hard it seemed to be to pass people. And obviously there at the end of the race, you were in a battle there with uh, Nunez. I was curious what it is like on the defensive side of that, trying to hold people off. Like how easy or how hard was that to do? Um, passing certainly is hard because then you try to go a different line and, you know, they can maybe get the run off. And that's with, with Luis, it was... Um, I, I kind of knew where he was going to go, and then he tr really went in hot there coming to the white flag, I think, and, you know, he just he couldn't make it stick, so he ended up almost losing four, too. But, yeah, it was um, very hard to pass, and you had to be keep, keep your eye on the mirror a little bit, too. Well, Jim, a great performance for you here tonight, uh, obviously with a couple of double points race coming up and you inside the top five in the points, Dane, still plenty of opportunity for you to get yourself up there into that championship picture by the time we get to Indianapolis. Congratulations on the podium finish tonight. Now we'll give you the opportunity to thank some sponsors and do some shout outs. Yeah, but, you know, thank Dark Horse for, for putting on the series and everything, Eric and Charlie. Uh, too bad he's not here. I guess he's working hard. Poor guy. And um, shout out to Area 51 and uh, our partnership with them. And thank you guys for uh, doing the race coverage. Do a great job. Uh, I'm going to be honest. Charlie Teed, working hard or hardly working? Ooh, I hope he doesn't watch this broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as Jim Brooks brings it home, third place here tonight under the lights at Richmond. Once again, congratulations on a great performance there, Jim. And uh, maybe we'll get to talk to you next week when we head to the Irish Hills. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. All right, let's see if we can get our runner-up finisher here tonight. Former champion and current points leader, Nick DeGroot. Hey, Nick, it's Alex Scott and Seth up here in the FRM booth. You got us? Yep, I got you. 
Well, man, I'll tell you what, we saw a lot of drivers struggle here tonight at Richmond, whether it was having trouble off of turn two, getting involved in some wrecks. I think you might have been the only driver here this evening that we didn't mention having an issue. You bring it <laughs> home in second place here tonight, but I mean, obviously, it couldn't have been as easy as it looked. Oh, yeah, I was on a knife sedge that entire race, as was everybody, as you saw there. This was uh, one of the more difficult DW12 setups I've driven in a long time, and I was just being so cautious. I didn't trust it anywhere. You probably saw all the terrible starts I had and restarts. I was just pedaling it because I did not trust that thing to not break loose on me on the restarts. And I certainly didn't trust it out of turn two after a couple laps. It was just, oh man, I, I Rick wins and he even, he, even he spun. It's, it's crazy how many uh, people uh, had incidents and crazy, crazier still that I somehow did it <laughs> i had a few moments i mean rick that's uh sorry rick nick <laughs> close, close. close rick with an n <laughs> uh uh nick talk to us about i mean it's about sometimes when you walk into a race you've, you've got to sit back and you got to look at that mindset and tonight it was it was about taking that mindset in of before you can go racing, you've got, to, you've got to get to that stage of the race where you can go racing. You set yourself up perfectly. I mean, you gave yourself an opportunity to win the race at the tail end there, and then you still just went, look, second place is enough. That's all I need to achieve here. Yeah, I wasn't going to push the issue there, knowing that at any moment the thing could break loose on me, and also knowing that in the dirty air, there's really not much you can do. Even Rick on that previous run, he had fresher tires, and I think he was also faster tonight. And even he still he couldn't get to me. He could get within like four or five tenths, but he could not get to me when the leader has that clean air. So once he won the race off pit road, that was, that was a, pretty much my mind mindset. I went from, all right, uh, doesn't look like we're going to win tonight. And you know, unless he breaks loose again, let's just make sure we don't break loose and we bring home a second place finish here. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what happened. I, I wish I could have been more aggressive on those restarts. Cause I think that would have been the opportunity to get them. But again, I just, I just did not trust myself. <laughs> Well, I mean, I was curious as well, because at one point you did have the lead over Rick Ravon later there in the race, just before the final two runs, and Rick Ravon managed to get around you. I mean, was that just you being cautious, not wanting to battle hard there and wreck yourself out of the race, or was that just a matter of Ravon just having the pace? Um, he actually did not get by me. He got close, but he he didn't get by me there. <laughs> but, oh. but uh, yeah, I, I, I honestly... Hard. No worries. I, I think he was faster, like I said there, and the fresh tires certainly helped him. But if that had gone green, um, he wins. He, he still wins, but by a much bigger margin because I think he would have got me. I think uh, we also would have had a longer pit stop because he was the leader of that group that pitted on the previous yellow, so he would have had a shorter final stop. And he just would have been gone at the end of that thing. So it was pretty much his race there. My only chance was, again, that last yellow off pit road. But he got me by just a nose. I, you know, it, it's so tempting to get on the thought. It's like, oh, just a couple mile per hour. This uh, I race, you won't notice. But you got to kind of stop yourself so you don't get a speeding penalty. I just want to ask you one final question here, Nick, in regards to points, because you came into this race the points leader. It's kind of seemed to be a three-horse race between yourself, Wagner, and Forrest Lights, swapping wins week after week. Well, here tonight, Wagner, an early exit from the race. Forrest Lights has issues, actually was involved in an incident on that final green flag run. You bring it home at second place, but there's those two double points race races, Michigan next week and the season finale at Indianapolis. So... Was the goal here tonight just to survive and preserve the points lead and then go back to work and trying to extend it when we get to the next speedway races in the next three weeks? Yeah, it's uh, very easy to get to a, get a false sense of security when you have that big of a points lead. But just like you said, two of the next three races are double points. That can shift this whole thing in a different direction if you're not careful. So we got to... We got to make sure we get the most out of Michigan and, of course, Indianapolis, the track I, I've always loved. But uh, Michigan's the one that has me a little worried because that's going to be probably a bit of a pack race. And uh, it's easy to lose the draft in these cars. And then you're kind of just sitting there hoping and praying for a yellow. So, yeah, we're going to try to keep this thing up front, try to keep it out of trouble. And hopefully we can bring home a boatload of points at Michigan so we don't have to worry too much in Indy. Well, a great run for you here tonight. Second place at Richmond. Nick, now we're going to give you the opportunity to thank some sponsors, do some shout-outs. 
Yeah, thank you to Factory Back Motorsports, CovingMore.com, Motorsport.com, Degrude Automotive, View Hall and Detailing, Cowboy Ship, Lace Pods, and uh, HyperX, and everybody else who helps make this possible. It's it's awesome to drive these cars, and uh, looking forward to another epic conclusion of uh, another season. Absolutely, so are we. That's Nick Degrude brings it home runner-up here tonight at Richmond International Raceway. Congratulations once again. Best of luck next week at Michigan. Thank you, guys. All right, let's go down to Victory Lane. First time this season, it's Rick Ravon. Hey, Rick, Alex, Scott, and Seth up here in the FRN booth. You got us? Hey, what's going on, Seth? I'll tell you what, pretty cool to see the champion number one car parked in Victory Lane here this season. Uh, first win on the year. We saw you have a really good run last week as well in your return to the series at Kentucky, but... Man, I mean, even tonight as the race leader, having some issues, Richmond, very difficult, it seemed, for everybody in the field. Describe that adventure of being up front, falling back outside the top five, and then working your way back up there once again. Yeah, well, you know, the idea was to try to get, uh, I mean, <laughs> Eric was so fast. I mean, that pole was incredible, and I was hoping to get a good run uh, on fresh tires, and I was able to get them, get the lead. You know, you want that clean air around here. Um, then after that, you know, I just kind of, you know, ran a good pace, but just mind my P's and Q's. I knew that everybody's work was cut out for them because it was just so slippery, especially coming off too. Uh, that was a real trouble spot. And that time when it went around on me, I was, you know, just, just when I started feeling comfortable, all of a sudden, whoop, it went around, you know, I was even, I was even shifting it into six gears. So it would kind of settle the car and you wouldn't have so much torque coming off the corner, but uh, it just jumped out on me, and I, I just can't figure it out. I was like, wow, man. It's a lot more slippery than I thought it was. Good to see Scott you. Rankin up here. Hey, there he is, Scott Rankin. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm back. I'm back for one more race. You got me for this week. I'm out of here next week. So. No. So don't you, don't you get... No, yeah, it's confirmed. It's confirmed. This is this. I, I thought last week was the final broadcast. Yeah, yeah, I'll I give you $1,000 a race to broadcast. I, look, that actually pays more than for me to go That's to the office on Thursday. That's what I thought. I would do that in a heartbeat. <laughs> God, I wish I had that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> look, so Rick and I have obviously got a fair bit of banter going on here. There's there's a lot here to sort of run through. But um, the best. look, I mean, uh, a tricky race here tonight. I, I think it, you were on the broadcast booth, so we swapped, swapped roles here tonight um for compared to last night's area 50 run race it looks pretty much the same tricky got to keep the rear end stable underneath you and in, in terms of a mindset whilst you're driving the car that takes a specific mindset you can't just settle the thing down you can't just take it easy you, you've got to get yourself in the game as well well yeah but like i said before you know turn two is a real trouble spot you can kind of you know run it down hard going into three and four but uh you know, I, and I, I told a couple of people before this race, not not here in, in uh, not the drivers, but a couple of people that watch the broadcast. I said, I'm going to have to mind my P's and Q's and just kind of, you know, take it easy to try to qualify up front and maybe get in the clean air. And that should help. But, uh, you know, you really you, you can't go all out because sooner or later it's going to bite you. And it, it bit some really good drivers here tonight. Uh, including myself, not that I'm saying I'm a good driver, but I guess I'm okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, tricky is an understatement because if, if it's going to bite some of the good guys, it could bite anybody. And I was just watching people spin. I was spinning in practice trying to figure this thing out. Other people were spinning out there, you know, DeGroote and, and uh, Peterson and, and, and Nunez and all of these really fast guys were spinning out there. And I'm like, oh, boy, this is going to be something. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that we heard from hey, um, Alex. Nick the Groot, yeah, hey, what's up, man? I'm back. <laughs> Is that um he was playing extremely carefully the entire race. Like he did not want to step on the throttle even a little yeah, bit too hard. hard. Were you a little bit more confident with the setup just to go a little bit harder than him? Is that why you had the pace tonight? Well, I was confident before it got sideways coming off too, and then all the confidence was gone. But I knew that I had my work cut out for me when I fell back to like, I think, sixth or seventh. And, you know, those those guys are fast. Trying to get around anybody here is difficult. But to, to get around a, uh, a guy who's running as fast as you is is even even harder. So I just I you know, I had my work cut out for me. And then I kind of threw caution to the wind and I said the heck with it, you know, because also I knew that once I was following behind somebody, you wouldn't have that that uh, um 
you know, the air to the front wings, there's not as much, so it's not going to be pressed down. So maybe you won't be so loose. So I just, I just started throwing it in there, man. And I was able to work my way back up. And then, uh, when I was closing in on Nick, I was getting excited, you know, to, to battle with him for the lead. And then the yellow came out. It was a little disappointing, but at that point I said, okay, we're going to come out on fresh tires, but if, if I don't get him in the pits, it's going to be tough to get around to Groot. So I'm just grateful that we had a, a quick pit stop. You know, the Gould charge was running great and they, the guys got me in and out of the pits <laughs> and uh, they just did a great job. And if it wasn't for them, maybe I wouldn't have won tonight. You know, Rick, obviously the first time this season I've gotten to talk to you since back at Indianapolis when you wrapped up the championship. And, you know, with having that championship in your back pocket now, being able to come in and not really have that pressure and that weight on your shoulders about racking up points. Now you can go out there and try and just get checkered flags. I mean, with tracks we got coming up in the next couple of weeks, including some double points races. I mean, just how does that feel? How does that change your approach when you come to the racetrack now here this season? Oh, it totally changes it. I mean, you know, last season I wanted the championship so bad. I would almost, I don't say worry myself sick, but, uh, I would, I would just have, uh, you know, crazy anxiety before the race because there was so much at stake. You know, when you're racing against a group of drivers like this, um, it's, it's not easy, you know, it's not easy at all. Uh, but we were able to come away at the championship and now it's just like, okay, we can go out there and sort of relax and have fun. You still want to win. You're still going to try hard, but all that pressure is off. So, um, it's, it's definitely a huge, huge relief. Well, great performance for you here tonight. A uh, little bump in the road there midway through, but you're able to bounce back and take this checkered flag here tonight. Spin Richard, and win. Congratulations on that. Yeah, there you go. A spin and win. <laughs> We're not in Vegas, though, so it doesn't quite count. Uh, but, man, I mean, yep. <laughs> But, uh, Rick, obviously, congratulations on the victory. Now we're going to hand the mic over to you for some victory link. Thank you, sponsors, and shout-outs. I want to thank um, the great um, – what's his name? Oh, yeah, Scott Rankin. I got to thank that oh. guy. I am so glad that he's in the booth. I love you, Seth. I love you, Alex. But Scott is my man. I just – I love this guy to death. He's awesome. Uh, Thanks for- kill me now. Kill Thanks. me now. Oh, I'm done. So, so glad that he appreciates my props. <laughs> Just wanted to say thanks to you uh, for showing up at least for one more race and maybe in the future. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Thanks to FRN, obviously, for broadcasting the race and uh, Eric Peterson and, uh, you know, for for uh, for Dark Horse and Charles T. He wasn't here tonight. I hope he's OK. I don't know what, what happened to Charles, but he wasn't here. But thanks to those guys for putting on the show. Thanks to the drivers out there, uh, you know, for, as usual, racing hard and clean. And a special shout out to uh, my man, Jay-Z, who uh, – follows my career and I'm sh- I know he was watching tonight. This one's for you, brother. And last but not least, of course, like I always do. Thank you to the Lord Jesus for my life. I love you, Lord Jesus. And I also want to uh, just say a little prayer for uh, the, the people in Ukraine and the people in uh, Australia and everybody that's affected by the pandemic, uh, COVID. Uh, my deepest prayers are with all of these people. Rick Gravon gets his sixth career win here in the Dark Horse Racing Series tonight at Richmond International Raceway. Congratulations once again, Rick, and uh, hopefully we get to talk to you here down the home stretch of the fifth season. Oh, that'd be wonderful. I'm having a great time, and I hope to talk to you guys again. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you. Absolutely. So as Rick Gravon continues to celebrate his victory here tonight, well, We kind of got all the question marks out of the way that we had at the beginning of the race. There might be a couple of lingering question marks at the end of this race, but now it's time for all of these drivers to get down to business because next week we head to Michigan International, double points on the line there. Of course, we've got the season finale at Indianapolis in three weeks' time, and the meat in that sandwich is going to be Chicagoland Speedway. I mean, uh, you know, talked about this tonight was all about finesse and not really pointing a wheel out of place. Next three weeks, it's going to be all about speed and all about how you're able to utilize the draft. Um, and critically as well for this league, they they also postponed, I believe it was a Kentucky race, um, just due to the or Kentucky or Kansas, just due to the issues that Eric Peterson was having, and you know they wanted to keep the the racing alive and and whatnot for him. So there was also that to look forward to at the tail end of the season as well. But yeah, speed. I mean, speed is the way that. You're going to go forward uh, in this league and pack racing over the next couple of weeks. Man, it's going to be intense. Uh, there's no other way uh, to say it other than intense for the next couple of weeks. That's for sure. Well, we you got any thoughts you- on the next couple of weeks, Alex? 
I mean, my thoughts on the next couple of weeks is that it's just been fun so far, so I'm just expecting more of it. You're just hearing along for the ride. You're here for the shenanigans. <laughs> Seth, crack out that crystal ball. What's coming in the next couple of weeks? Uh, what do you think? Well, What's your prediction? I mean, I honestly think that we're going to see a resurgence of Matt Wagner for one thing. He's very good when it comes to the two-mile racetracks. Uh, I know that he's got at least a win at both Michigan and Auto Club in his career. So next week, keep your eye on him. The hardship here tonight, he'll be looking for a comeback run. Craig Forsythe was up in the conversation at Auto Club in the season opener, so we know he's going to be fast next week. Nick DeGroot says that he's got a lot of confidence, loves Indianapolis in the season finale. But I'm also looking at those other guys just on the outside. I think Luis Gonzalez, Nunez, Gail Brooks, Jim Brooks. I think those three are going to be ones to watch here down this home stretch because with the two double points races, if they can get up there and finish inside the podium, even take a checkered flag and the other top three in the point standing struggle in those p specific races, we could have a whole different outlook on who's in the hunt for that championship when we get to the Art of Bricks. So, you know, with having those two double points races, it could change everything up. Keep your eyes on the top six or seven when we eventually get to Indianapolis, because a lot could change between now and then. Yeah, but that's I think good. you said it all. I think you said it all. It's it, it's going to be exciting to the end of the season. All right, you, you close it out, Seth. You, 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 you've right. done the job so far. You close it out. Well, we appreciate everybody joining us here tonight for the rather chaotic but certainly exciting race here at Richmond International Raceway. We hope you guys enjoyed it. We hope you continue to join us here for the remainder of Season 5 of the Dark Horse Racing Series presented by Troy Lee Designs. Next week, we are in the Irish Hills, the two-mile speedway slash super speedway of Michigan International Speedway. We'll be bringing you coverage and the green flag at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time next Wednesday night. Alex, Scott, it's been great to be back in the booth here with you guys. Scott, obviously, we're going to miss you. We hope that you're going to be seeing you back here in the you're booth. You're not going to miss me. We will you're definitely so happy. miss you. You're I'm happy to drink I'm a milkshake in your honor next week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Seth. Oh, you wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, great to be in the booth with you guys here tonight. Appreciate you joining me here and uh, looking forward, obviously, to next week and the continuation of the season. Once again, thanks to everybody that tuned in tonight. We'll see you guys next Wednesday night as you've been watching yet another broadcast courtesy of the Flat Out Racing Network. This broadcast is the copyrighted work of Flat Out Racing Network and may not be rebroadcast, retranslated, or used in any form without the express written consent of Flat Out Racing Network and iRacing.com Motorsports Simulations. Flat Out Racing Network would like to thank you for your support, and we hope you enjoyed tonight's broadcast.